And in fact, the word corporation is from Latin because the first corporations that we would really think of and understand uh, actually come out of the Roman Republic. Not the Roman Empire, by the way. And sometimes I wish that we had enough time in these meetings to really ask ourselves, what happens when a republic devolves into an empire? Because that might be an important conversation in the United States today. Right? It might be very important. Maybe, maybe Scott, that might be a good third Thursday conversation. But the word corporation comes from Latin because those first Roman Republican corporations were actually used to do some interesting things. For example, have you all heard the phrase, all roads lead to Rome? Yeah. Sound familiar, right? Check it out. Those roads were actually laid out, built by, maintained under the auspices of a Roman Republican corporation. Likewise, the aqueduct system, that amazing bit of engineering that actually moved water all across the Italian peninsula. I mean, human beings are clever, right? And that's actually a bit of incredible good news, is the fact that we are clever and there are solutions to all of the problems that face us. Even today, we're just not able to implement them because we don't actually have the authority yet. But that aqueduct system was designed under the auspices of, maintained, built by a Roman corporation. Likewise, the first universities that we would think of and understand today were Roman corporations. The first hospitals, can you guess? A Roman corporation. So here's a question for y'all. What does a road system, a water system, a university, a hospital all have in common? Say it again. They're the public. They're the common. The reality is that the genius, that's a C. Would you like that to see? The genius of the original Roman corporation was to create public entities and public projects. But there was a particular genius because it was to take voluntary private money. For example, let's say this. Let's say, oh my God, y'all, I have a genius idea on how we can make Whittier and the very surrounding area completely food secure. Y'all familiar with food security and that phrase? What does it mean? It means, it means secure in food. You have enough food to eat. And now I'm telling you, we know that there are starving people and hungry people here in Whittier. Y'all know because y'all feed those people. Right? Here at this church. So you know that exists. Well, I've got a brilliant idea for how we can create genuine food security and address the chronic unemployment situation that's affecting so many of our young people here in this area. I'm working with people at the university. I'm working with gardeners. I'm working with farmers. I'm also working with community organizers. We're going to bring this whole thing together and we're going to teach people and give them the land and the resources to actually grow food. It will be organic. It will be fresh. It will all be local. We will also distribute that food uh, everywhere. It's an amazing mechanism. We'll give young people meaningful, productive work that will make them inspired and, and feel good about themselves. We'll also teach them an incredible talent. Uh, they will feel good about going to their neighbors and providing food to people. We'll start with uh, the, the poor and the, the most hungry. Then we'll go to our seniors and give them food. And then we'll make sure that everybody is participating. Does that sound good? All right, that's great. So here's the thing. Scott, I just need $100 from you to make this happen. Are you good for $100? Right on. Sister, how about $100 from you? Are you good? Well, it's kind of tight right now. It's tight? Can I get $50? All right, 50. Can I get some, brother? Sure. All right, yes? Oh, yeah, two weeks. No, no, no. no? Oh, is, there anything, is there anything I can do to convince you, maybe, could I offer you a return on your initial investment? Ah. <laughs> See, folks, the genius of the idea of the corporation comes out of that taking private money sometimes Maybe it's just a volunteer, voluntary gift and donation. Maybe it's to entice a return on the investment. Now, this is not the first time in Roman history that private money was taken, right? Because there was another way that private money might be taken. What was that called? Taxes. Orlando, when the centurion shows up, does the centurion for tax purposes say, here, let me explain to you what the idea is that we're going to do with your tax dollars? They just take it. Or, and then the, when somebody says no, does the centurion say, can I convince you to pay your taxes? No, the centurion would 
put the spear right to the throat and say, pay up. Here's the thing, y'all. The genius of the first Roman corporations were not just not just to do a public good, but it was to take private money voluntarily. Because a tax, a tax is mandatory. The idea of the corporation is to take voluntary private money, resources, sweat equity, and put it to a public project. And that's a good idea. Do not let it be said that David Cobb is anti-corporation. I am not anti-corporation. Do not let it be said that the move to amend coalition is anti-corporation. I am not anti-corporation. In fact, I am proud to say I am pro-commerce. I am pro-business. I am pro-appropriate business. I am pro-appropriate commerce. Of course this is a good idea. We should not throw out the baby with the bathwater. This is a good idea. But the problem, of course, is that the modern transnational business corporation doesn't exactly operate like that, does it? No, and that's because the modern transnational corporation doesn't actually come out uh, of uh, the Roman Republican model that I just described to you. The initial transnational corporations that we would know and think of actually were created during the 13th, 14th, and 15th century of Europe. You know, the age of discovery. I had to put discovery in quotation marks, right? Because, like... What did they discover? And who was they? Well, they were the Euro white Europeans. And what did they discover? Why well, they discovered Africa, Asia, later North and South America. Newsflash. There were people living there. They weren't lost. They didn't need to be discovered. So in fact, let's actually say what it really is. That age, that era, is the era of rape and pillage and plunder and murder. There's one word that we can use, imperialism, right? That's the age of imperialism. And we need to tell the truth about that because what imperialism means is literally to conquer, to go out militarily, to conquer other people, to beat them down, to kill them if necessary, steal their resources, and bring them back to the home empire or the capital of empire. That's what it means. It's ugly, it's brutal, it's nasty, and we should... Talk about it honestly that that's actually the birth of the transnational corporation because here's the kicker. The first corporations that we would ever understand and know were created as instruments of colonial conquest and imperialism. Check it out. One of the early corporations was the Dutch East Indies Corporation and it was specifically designed to legalize the brutal oppression of the entire uh, area that we now know as Indonesia, that entire archipelago, that's what it was designed to do. Another of the very early corporations or joint stock companies was called the Africa Trading Company. Does anybody want to hazard a guess what the Africa Trading Company traded? People. People. Thank you, Orlando. This sister said it too. What's your name? Laurel. Laurel said people. Thank you so much, Orlando. Thank you so much, Laurel. Because frankly, I submit to you that when we say and think initially that they get traded slaves, it shows our own colonized minds. Mine too. Mine too. We have been assaulted by propaganda and about the story of how things go. Because here's another way to ask a question. Was Africa just full of slaves? No! Africa was filled with people, human beings. And may I say, in the spirit of truth-telling, people basically just like me. And I say that with full understanding of my pigment, but I say it with confidence, because if you ask any scientist, if you ask any biologist, she or he will tell you race does not exist. I mean, sure, skin pigment exists, ethnicity exists, but no scientist or biologist would elevate these to a taxonomy. But check it out, especially for white folks. Race does not exist, but racism damn sure does. <laughs> Why? Well, because if enough people think that something is true, if enough people act like it's true, it's true, it becomes true. And here's the reason I'm going down this particular bit of analysis together with you 
is because I submit that I think I have a handle on why the creation of race as a construct becomes apparent and used in human civilization at the same time as the birth of the modern transnational corporation, which happens to be at the same time as the birth of modern imperialism, and it's because they are inextricably linked. And it goes something like this. It has everything to do now with the concept of slavery. And so, as an example, I'm going to say, let's say that Orlando and I are uh, in different tribes, right? There's a river separating us. My tribe goes to war against Orlando's tribe. My tribe wins the war. And, oh, why might my tribe win this war? I've got, I've got help. Guns. I've got better weapons. Bigger army. I mean, these are all these are all good they have more resources I mean those are all good you know reasons and good potential suggestions I haven't given you I haven't given you enough facts to really be able to answer that so you're coming up with pretty good potential explanations right you want me to tell you why my my, my tribe wins this war because I'm telling the story <laughs> ah! think about it right whoever inordinate power in how that story goes. And we should think about that. It, for example, when we're hearing about the contract negotiations going on with United uh, Food and Commercial Workers, we should ask ourselves, who are we listening to? Are we listening to 30 second sound bites from the corporate media? Or are we listening to our sisters and brothers who are actually engaged in that struggle? Because a different story will be told. So in this story, Orlando, unfortunately for you, I'm telling the story. So my side wins the war. I put my spear up against Orlando's throat, and I say, you're now my slave. Let me ask you something, folks. What is the philosophical justification for me to enslave Orlando? What's the, the, the moral, intellectual justification? <laughs> say it again. It's <laughs> inferiority. It's inferiority. It's just power over, right? It's nothing but power. So let me tell you something. I submit to you that the idea of race gets created in order to attempt in an utterly foolish, ridiculous way to justify the enslavement of an entire group of people for nothing else than payment. And so another way to say that is that corporatism and militarism or imperialism and racism are inextricably linked together. And in fact, I'm not the first American to say that because one of the great Americans of our modern times said basically the same thing in what I believe is his best political speech. It's not his most famous speech because this famous American I'm thinking about, his most famous speech is, I have a dream. And that's a beautiful speech that the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. gave. I've heard it. It's stirring. It's wonderful. He gave it on the mall in Washington to over 100,000 people who were gathering together. And it is a beautiful speech. But Martin Luther King Jr.'s best speech was a speech he gave at the Riverside Church in Harlem. And in that speech, it's known as Beyond War or Beyond Vietnam. And in that speech, King very clearly and articulately said the moral and ethical decay of this country can be tied directly to the triple evils. And he said evil of militarism, extreme materialism, and racism. That those three things were inextricably linked and unless and until the American people were willing to dismantle those evils, to address those evils, the moral and ethical decay would continue. And you know what? He was right then. He's right now. The problem is that we as a people in the United States have not addressed racism. We have not addressed extreme materialism or what I will call capitalism. We have not actually addressed those evils. And that's the problem. Let's fast forward the story of the corporation as well, and let me just say this. 